Okay, right, so we are going to look at, this is, this is me aiming to do two of the most complicated aspects of racing sailboats, starting in tactics, in the quickest, simplest way forward. And me and Carl had a good lengthy discussion this afternoon about this, that I think looking at things in their simplest form is equally good for people who are beginning and first getting into racing as it is to people who've been doing it for quite a long time to reassess, maybe just think about things they're doing in a slightly different way. So on that note, we're going to try and get into this as quick as possible. So I'm going to start with a little recap on last week for anyone who missed it, because this leads into our start. We were talking about slow boat handling, uh, keeping control of your boat, putting your boat where you want it on the start line, holding your position. You know, these are all things that I've got written there on the screen that are really, really important to getting a good start. And practicing these sort of exercises, like I've got Simon doing here in the RS100 uh, in the photo, um, these are, these are perfect for, for improving your confidence and ability on the start line. Um, and as well, we also mentioned last week, this is the kind of thing you need to practice for slow boat maneuvering to get on and off the slipway as well. So, you know, something that's incredibly useful to, uh, to everyone. Okay, so just gonna show you through the video, although some of you saw it last week, which is looking at Simon trying to do a little exercise where, as you can see, there's a shifty light wind in the river He's right alongside the club pontoon and then just to the right at the end of the pontoon we've got like a, a little uh, practice start line which is the corner of the pontoon to the first of the yellow boys so simon's using a few techniques here to keep the boat stationary you can see no wake on the bow not moving forward now he's trying to get it to move forward so he heals the boat fills the sail hikes out, you see accelerate and crosses the start line there between the yellow um, ladder and the yellow boy. So we were just looking at him doing some slow boat maneuvering and then getting the boat from a stop position to going forwards at speed best you can in the conditions. Right, this is the video that we tried to show you last week of a fantastic start. So practicing your starts. This is the Homewood family. Uh, we have Steve Homewood there in the Aero 9 with the pink bit on the sail. Uh, Jane Homewood, Steve's wife, or Jane Wild, uh, in the Aero face uh, sail onto us there in the middle. And 1402 is Will Homewood, their now 16 year old son. All very good sailors, you know. Um, and we did a family days coaching with the three of them, just working on slow boat maneuvering, uh, practice starts, and then some very short races. And this is just a fantastic start where Jane stuffs the rest of the family. Great fun. There we go. So we can see Steve's trying to be the windward boat. The start line is between these two red marks. It's a pretty good start line. We're pretty square to the wind. Sorry, uh, two orange marks there. I'm just coming in now. I'll just turn a bit of volume on so we can. There we go. So Jane kind of shut everyone out there by sailing up below, holding her, her boat where she wanted to be and accelerating away at the start, making sure you're on the line at the right time and going fast. That's some of the key things we're going to talk about with starting. Okay. So start lines. We're, We've all, we've all probably had discussions about start line tactics and so on. The key things to start with is where do we want to be on the line? You see in this photo here, this is the Merlin Rocket open meeting at Lymington. I think it was two years. Um, if we look in the far end of the photo up here, there's a yacht in the distance. That yellow point at the end of my uh, cursor arrow there, that's the far end of the line. And it's the, the race officer taking the photo to make sure no one's over. I'm presuming this is on the gun, or maybe just slightly before. So you can see that's Mike Calvert there. He looks like he's gonna be pretty close to the line. He's got less than half the boat length to the line. John Gorringe, David Gorringe's uh, younger brother, I think. I think it's younger, from uh, Pool Sailing Club. Um, 
you know, these guys are all fighting for the committee boat end, looking for a bit of clear wind. So what are the factors that are most important to us when we're starting? What makes us decide where on the line is favoured for us to start? And this is my favourite question, I think. What is a good start? I'll open, uh, I'll open that to the floor. So anyone got any, uh, any ideas, any comments there? Well, seeing as this is Limington, um, which is the end of the line that has the least tide? Yeah, that's a very important part, the tide, yeah. What other factors, you know, if you, on the start line, so we, tide, as we know from Carl's talk last week, incredibly important. Okay. Uh, sorry, say that one again. The, the favoured end, yeah. The angle of the line, so that it's not, it's, sorry, a, a fair line, a straight line is perpendicular to the uh, direction of the wind. So a bias line would be one where one end of the start line is angled more towards the wind. So one tack is favoured rather than the other. Usually okay. poor. Oh, I didn't catch that one. Usually it's the poor end if the race officer's done his homework right. <laughs> yeah, generally the poor end, that's true. Okay, well, let's look at a couple of things that I thought of here. So, uh, yeah. Are you talking about one design starts or? As we do at Lumington, perhaps. No, I think we we'll, we'll look at oh. yes. Yeah, no, all sorts. So we've got tidal bias, line bias, as Stuart said, wind bias. You know, if you've got a long line, you can have more pressure on one end than the other. Um, when you're thinking about your start line, where you want to position yourself, you've got to think of your uh, pre-race strategy, your tactics. Then, like Richard said, if you're racing in the handicap fleet. No point starting when you've got a bigger, faster boat either above you or below you that's going to compromise what you do off the start line. So therefore, you think about the opposition. Uh, having clear wind pre-start, you want to be able to put your boat where you want it to be. You don't want to be sitting in a wind shadow of a bunch of other boats, unable to manoeuvre, and then suddenly realise you've got five seconds to go, no momentum and no breeze to get moving in. Getting away from the line, it's always something we've got to think about making sure that once we've got our boat on the line at full speed, that we're not going to be compromised by somebody sailing higher below us or somebody, uh, uh, you know, putting a tack in if we've decided to start on port and then make, forcing us, us off to, uh, to go the way we didn't want to. Um, and our ability to execute your start. So if you've been out there practicing your uh, slow boat handling and so on, uh, recently or uh, before your first race you'll probably be quite confident in your ability to uh, stop the boat or move it move it around slowly but maybe you haven't had the chance and you're like me and your boss has given you way too much work and you're merlin rockets in bits and uh, you know you're probably doing the first three race officer duties of the season as well so you might be a bit rushed getting out there so in that situation i've also got to think about my ability to execute a good start so i might not take as big a risk to get the uh, particular end of the stop line that I want to get. I might just look for a bit more space, a bit more clear room, and just make sure that I'm on that line at the right time, going fast and sailing confidently. A little bit of a video here. This is a, uh, a, a start off Bavistock. Um, I was race officer, I think it's about a year ago. And this is the medium handicap fleet. So Aeros, Taser, Seafly, uh, I think that's Ben and Chloe in the Merlin, uh, Rob and Jan down there in the far corner. So just looking at the line, I've got the lovely Abby helping me as assistant race officer. There she is. Uh, the pin is just there. You can just about see a little yellow thing. Okay, three, two, one. Ooh, I think Rob and Jan just over. Now, if I just pause this a second and we look at this, so these guys were a little bit late for the start, not massively late. If we just whiz it back a bit. Here we go. Rob and Jan, they're down there. They were just over, probably by about a bow length, a metre. I think this arrow here, Pete Barton, you'll probably have to identify that one. 1783, I think it is. Uh, they look pretty good on their timing. 
Jenny's time. Jeff. It was Jeff. Okay. Um, Jenny looks pretty good here. Oh, is it Jenny or Julie? Uh, 2949. Yeah. Jenny. Jenny. Excellent. Yeah, Jenny's timing looks really good. She's at pace. But as we can see, she's got a bigger, faster boat to windward of her and to lure it off her. You can't always avoid the situation, but um, yeah. probably the, the worst off in this bit of the photo is poor old Sean here in his solo, where he's in the gas at the back of the Merlin. He's got an Aero 5 about the same speed sailing over him, and an RS 300 sailing over him as well. I'm just going to play this on a bit Great. so we can see what we, what's going on. So yeah, we can see uh, poor old Sean is sailing in some really bad air here. Mm -hmm. Ben and Chloe look pretty nice as they move away. Richard looks pretty good there in his taser as well. Ben was a little bit late in the RS300. He might have been being shut out by Jenny. She's sailing quite smartly. But um, yeah, we're just looking at you know different boats, different type of people on the in a in a handicap fleet, and their different ideas of you know where they want to position themselves. I'll just play this one out. There's only a few seconds left on it. Uh, Annie, very late, and sailing low. And there we go. It's uh, our mate Henry Ayres, I think, going across in his Phantom, trying to clear his wind mm -hmm. and uh, get get a clean, clean lane to sail upwind. Okay, all right, so. What influences a successful start? What is a good start? Why do some boats do better than others on the start line? So many things to think about when you're starting, but what are the key factors? Can we break it down and make it simple like I promised we'd do? Just looking at these, just looking at these photos again, you know, for, these are just captions from that, that, that little bit of video there. See, Rob and Jan, a little bit early because the flag's still up. Their bow's right on the pin. Knowing Rob and Jan, they probably went back and restarted because they were over. There's our aero, absolutely perfectly on the line, at speed, in space, looking great. 3802, this is a guest sailor, Simon Potts. A little bit lower, shorter the line probably, but going like an absolute train and about to sail over his competitor in the Merlin next to him. What things are all these people considering when they try to get the better start in these pictures? Here's a few ideas I had. Can anyone spot anything I've missed? Flip back to the picture a minute, Gareth. Sure. I think the way everybody held on on that start out to the left is the tide's under. So I yep. think there's a bit of line sag because everyone's just holding back ever so slightly. And that's yep. the consideration. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, Stuart, it's quite hard to hear you there. Okay, we're just saying tide's ebbing, so everybody's going with it. Yeah, that's it. Do you want to bring your sofa near the camera? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the tide's very obviously heavy because the ferry's punching up tide, isn't it? You can see in the background. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice one, Sherlock. Well spotted. Good spot, yeah. that. Okay. Oh, so tells us having a plan. Having a plan. Yeah, I've missed that off the list. Having a plan. Working out what we want to do once we leave the uh, the uh, the start line and the start area. You know, uh, this this these photos, this this little bit of video we watched that was going out towards the southwest. Um, you got tide under the boats, so it's probably quite a a fair tidal course. Um, you know, we're at the far side of Bavistock, the uh, the southern side of Bavistock, so we're probably looking at a race where um, where the tide would be pushing you upwind. So in that case, there's probably not much of a benefit from being one end of the line to the other end of the line with the amount of tide. The pin end might be slightly more tidally favoured, not, not massively. 
what we're looking for in this race is probably more about tacking on shifts and sailing in clear air. So these were a few things I thought of that influence a successful start. So getting the right end of the line, my tactics for the first leg, timing, starting at speed, having clear wind to sail in, getting away from the line and ability to execute my start. So start, starting at speed. Rich, why would you say starting at speed is preferable to just being on the line at the right time? Um, for a skiff or for just generally? Just generally. Well, starting at speed, it gives you flow over the foils, it gives you maneuverability, which is always nice, particularly you know, if you're on a timed run. Uh, and being on the line, you've got to be absolutely nailed on. So in that last image where you're being flooded over, you, you can't burn off speed if you don't have any. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why I go to speed. Yeah, that's all pretty good. You can see in this photo here, there's a, a lard ass there in uh, in a <laughs> Lilac Merlin Rocket at Sulcombe Week with Ollie Turner just below him and um, HD Sales uh, Taxi just below there. Uh, this is probably the best start I've ever had in a Merlin Rocket. Um, it wasn't the best woman mark rounding and I went from there, but I was uh, patiently waiting and holding my position. I've got my boat not pointing towards the line, but sitting on a reach with the sails flapping, trying to make sure nobody gets in the gap between me and Ollie below me. Um, yeah, I'm not going to show you the start. Um, I couldn't find the video footage, uh, but it's good. Did you get, did you get wind with your top baton inverted? Was that the reason? <laughs> I didn't quite trust the uh, the Mill Bay lift as much. Oh as yeah, that old chestnut. Yeah. I was getting. I thought they were coming up on me, and so I tacked off too early. But um, yeah, lesson learned. Right, look. Here's a, here's a little start line. Um, just looking at the idea of splitting your start line into three sections. So we've talked about one end having a bias, one end not having a bias due to the angle of the wind, the pin. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the the angle of the wind, the strength of the tide and our strategy upwind. So let's say our strategy for this start is to go up the middle. Can somebody maybe tell me which end of, which third of the line their preference, the right end by the committee boat, the middle, or the left end by the blue flag? Um, Claire Slay, why don't you give us an answer, Claire? I did, you know, I cannot, I never tell which end of the line is favoured. So uh, I'm probably 180 degrees or, but I think the pin end is the favoured end. Okay. And what makes you think the pin end's favoured most? Because of the angle that the wind is at the time of the start, it'll be, you, know, you won't have to sail as far to get to the windward mark. Yep. And, and what's the other big clue about what's favoured the... Uh, oh, the tide, the tide. Big fat. So the tide is pushing uh, you over and giving you extra, however many couple of knots uh, while you're sailing out. Yeah. And you can also sail out and out and out and, and keep as, as long as you need to, almost to the ley line, to before you turn in again for the windward mark. Yeah, that's yep. good. That's good, yeah, I, I, I'd yeah. agree with now I'm going to throw in another mitigation here, so I'm just going to see who else I've got on the trip. Uh, Gareth, can I just to make a point? Yes, please, Malcolm. Yeah, go for it. So in your diagram there, if the tide was equal all the way across, yeah, then the um, committee boat end would be the favoured end for just the wind. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. the way I think about that is that you can see that the wind has got a slight angle. Yeah. If in your mind, you give the wind a much bigger angle so that it's coming from almost behind the committee boat and you're trying to get to the windward mark, clearly then the committee boat, you can visualize is much nearer the wind than yeah. the pin end is. Yeah. So when so, I'm trying to decide which end is the favored end, mentally I sort of think, well, which end is the wind broadly coming from? So in this one, 
it's slightly towards the committee boat. In my mind, I think, well, supposing it was coming in an extreme version in that direction, then clearly the committee boat in your mind, you go, oh yes, okay, the committee boat is the favored end, I can see it now. So yeah. sometimes just exaggerating the picture of the angle helps you decide which is the favored wind end. Definitely, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of just uh, either shooting the breeze or just sitting reasonably close hold and letting the sails flap just for, for five seconds. And in general, whichever end of the line the sail's pointing to is going to be your favourite end. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, that was a good call. So if the tide was even, committee vote would be biased because the wind's coming a little bit more from the right. So uh, so you'd be sailing higher and a shorter distance on, on starboard tack. Um, yeah, no, that's good. Now, I just want to throw another thing in here, Malcolm, this would be a great one for you. So let's say this is the scenario. We've got more tide at our pin end. We've got a slight, uh, the slight bias with the wind. Um, now let's just throw in, like with the start line we watched the video of just now, a couple of Merlin rockets down here and uh, a couple up there and a few arrows and, and a taser dotted around like a medium handicap fleet. If you throw in that, that, those sort of boats, where do you think you'd start then? Yes. You don't, um, you wouldn't want to be underneath the Merlins, you'd want to be above them. Yeah. So I'd probably be in, in the, the, the middle section towards the pin end half of it. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm, I'm probably going to want to go left because if this is Limington, there'll be even more tide the further left you go. Correct. Um, so I'm going to want to carry on going left. So I might as well start towards the left. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, that's, that's, that's what I'd be looking to do in the solo as well. You know, you can see this is a slight sort of, you know, um, uh, diagram of, of, of the start we were just looking at. So, uh, you know, Rob Martin was going <coughs> right in and his quite quick boat, got there a little bit early, overestimated the tide. Um, I think it was Simon Potts and Ben and Chloe were in their Merlins around here. They were running a little bit late for the line, but uh, they were looking to keep a windward advantage. Richard Russell was probably, and, and that aero were somewhere around where Malcolm's saying looking to stay away from boats at the side, keep the wind clear and get going fast. Gareth, yeah. Gareth, can I ask a question? So here I am in my laser radial, so I'm quite slow um, yep. and I know I'm looking for clear air, but why, but I also know that the tide is, and I want to be towards the pin end. Why can't I be close to the Merlin rockets? Knowing the Merlin rockets are going to be whizzing away from me as quick as you like yeah no it's a really good point you know you'd <laughs> suffer the dirt of a merlin rocket for maybe what a minute or, or or the taser richard russell you know he's he's always an interesting one on our start lines in the medium handicap he points incredibly high so if he's below you he's going to force you to attack if he wants to because he'll just keep stiffing up, 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 up dragging you over um so yeah, you know, in in a, in a laser radio compared with something like a Merlin or a Taser, which are very fast in comparison, uh, or a Phantom, you probably wouldn't have much trouble around those boats. Maybe you'd have more in the radial if you were near the Solos or yeah. the Aero Five, maybe. And you know, yes. So then, then I, I kind of want to keep away from boats that are very similar um, speed to to me. But yeah. okay. Yeah, thank you. Like, likewise, in the fast fleet where you've got Richard in his RS seven hundred, and if if he's got yeah. you know Mike below him in a contender, I think a contender can probably point you quite considerably, can't it? Well, um, I think for for me it's the same situation, but with four RS four hundreds. Yeah. Um, and although maybe the speed differential between myself and Claire might be not the same thing. Sitting below that boat, 
it's going to hold you there, either making you tack off or, or getting stuck. Claire might consider the port approach, take a couple of transoms, and as Henry did in that last bit of video footage, get out to the right, get into clear air, and flick over early. Yeah. And hold the right. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just going to move on to another scenario. Here we go. This is another typical Limington uh, Sunday morning race. This time we've got the, the wind in green, slightly off perpendicular, and we've got strong tide again at the pin end, weaker tide at the committee boat end, but the tide's in the same direction as the wind. So I'm just gonna go through the uh, random scores here, and I'm going to see um, Paul, Paul Champion. Would you, would you like to give us an idea of what you think about this start line? Where would you see the, the best end to start for yourself? Hmm. Um, I think maybe towards the committee boat end of things, just because of the fact that I've got a, I've got a lesser tide. Um, wind is the same wherever I am on the line um um so i would i would say to well as i'm speaking sorry <laughs> as i'm speaking i'm thinking maybe a central position um and then with a the central position knowing that the wind is uh, I'm, I'm essentially uh the wind's coming straight in front of me i, I then i then got options I, I feel like i might have more options ahead of me uh, in terms of being able to choose my um, choose my tack, but um, yeah, I think my gut goes with the committee go co committee boat end. Okay, cool. Who else have we got on here? Let's have a look. Um, Simon Gaiman, great one. All right, Simon, uh, Aero Seven, isn't it? So yeah, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I'm out of focus, so sorry about that. Um, right. So. I think, I mean, there's a very, very slight bias on the line from the wind, but not enough, I don't think, to worry about given the relative tide. So I I think I'd be aiming for the committee boat um, and it would depend who else is around me and how good my start and positioning is around the committee boat. Generally, I'm pretty fast upwind compared to most other boats in the handicap fleet I'm sailing in. So I'd probably look to win the committee boat, or if I think I'm not going to do that, then I'll assess who's around me and work out where's the best space towards the committee and boat of the line, where I'll have a clear air and a good start. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Declan, lovely to see you on a Wednesday evening. Declan, you generally sell quite fast boats, D ones and so on. What would you think in a in a you know handicap fleet? Where would you be thinking? Which is that was working in the background. Um, I I start the committee boat end and then flick over out of the tide as soon as I could. I don't think the yeah. wind's that much paying off that much. Yeah, compared to the tide. So um, who else have we got on here? Nick Ingram, and and we got Stuart Watson. We've got two two of the ultimate folk boat sailors in the club. Um, so if this was a, a folk boat fleet start, um, and you're all folk boating, what do you guys think? Uh, should we start with Stuart? On the, boat with me. on the committee boat, if at all possible. Unfortunately, there's one other person in the fleet who was always on the committee boat. So you don't fight, you then give way and you go for as quick as possible just below them. Okay, yeah, nicking. My point um, is only one, only one person can make a really good start. Only one person can make a really good start. That is a very valid point, isn't it? And what's I mean, your strategy below them, Stuart? Uh, we're usually faster, so it's not too much. Pray they, pray they tack. They will tack. <laughs> they tack. <laughs> you go okay. a bit far. You Have go you got a bit, a bit more height on them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, Nick, um, let's well, just 
You've got Stuart, your... Uh... Stuart's probably right. I mean, it's usually a bum fight at the committee boat end. So you need to be about three boat lengths down if you want a reasonable chance of avoiding that. Having said that, you might think about coming along a port and tip behind the line until you can find a gap. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's an issue. Try a late start at the committee vote. Yeah, you could do a late start. Yeah, I mean, valid. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things we addressed earlier on was, you know, we've got to think about what we want to do after the start. If there's less tide inshore and the wind, as you can see from the arrow, is very, very slightly angled. So port tack might be slightly favoured. After this start, we might want to be having over to the right hand side of the course. Yeah. Take one other thing, to the yeah, one other thing is knowing your competitors, so knowing their strengths and weaknesses, knowing who you're racing against. Exactly. Knowing knowing who you're racing against. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um so let's have a quick look through. Have we got Pete Barton? Pete Barton. I remember Pete Barton telling me that his, uh, no, Heather Chipperfield told me that when she sailed with Pete, she asked him what his idea of good tactics were, and he said, getting the best start and not letting anyone overtake you. So, mm -hmm. Pete, <laughs> Pete, what are your thoughts on, uh, on a start line like this, where everyone wants to start on that committee boat there? Well, well. Tides against you, so you can get stuck in early and you won't be moving forwards very fast. So get in early and reserve your space. And you should be able to be pretty stationary on that start line, maybe just with a bit of side slip down the line because it's against you. Um, there's hardly any port bias on it, but there is tide offshore. So there's definite advantage at the committee boat and to tack early. Um, question is, why is the wind at an angle is it always there like that, or is it because of a shift, in which case you want to tack early, ready for the shift to go back again? But on this one, it would be different if the tide was the other way, and you'd have to have a good long time to run at it because you'd be crossing the line really quickly. But the tide against you, you can go and reserve your space. But I think what's really valuable is to try and assess maybe at one minute to go or 90 seconds to go, where the really crowded bit of the line is going to be because you might be able to tell it's going to be super crowded at the committee boat, which is when you might think it's much more, much safer to start just to leeward of a crowded pack. Yeah. Yeah. Start, starting in a crowded area, one of the most important things you can look for is getting your boat up to speed fast so you can get your nose out. I'm sure in, a, in the aero fleets, so you, you, you must always be looking for... Uh, Trying to just be going that little bit faster at the start than, um, than than your competitors around you, Pete. What's it like when you sail at the nationals? And, you know, everyone's on the line, everyone's good. What, what, what do you do to get your nose ahead and just give yourself a chance? Well, I, th I think moding's critical. So if you were to start just to lured a very crowded pack, then you might be looking for a low and fast mode so that you were sailing away from the crowded bit of boats and nobody rolled you off the line if you could get a great start relative to them and get your bow ahead in this scenario where you want to tack onto port quickly then to point really high and lee bow of them into attack would be an advantage if you could yeah um but certainly be either being able to choose between going low and fast or high and slow is important on a crowded start line so that you can maintain what lane you've got for a little bit longer yeah so if we were to split this a start line into thirds, we've got everyone agreeing the right hand side and this is, is very good. The middle, it's not bad, but you do want to try and go off onto, onto port tack as soon as you can. So it's, it's not great. And the pin end looking very poor. So we've had a few different people's uh, thoughts on what they might do in these situations. Right, so let's have a look at tactics simplified. Whilst we're talking about starting, a lot of our theory on where we want to start on the line is very much based on what happens as we go up the track. 
Now, tactics, I'm not going to split into windward and lured. I'm going to try and keep tactics down to the absolute bare minimum things that I think are important. And we're going to see if, 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 if you know, if it, how we sort of feel with that. I'm trying to simplify, to uncomplicate, to untangle all the millions of things you got with tactics. So, uh, you know, we can really overcomplicate sailing when we want. Let's try and look at the very basics of what we're doing when we go sailing to try and win a race. So why do sailors, here's a good one, why do top sailors do a practice first beat before the race? What are they looking for? Why are they looking for something? <laughs> um, what will our first beat research or what will their first beat research give them? So um, who we got there? Let's uh, have a look. I'll pick a name out of the hat. Um, Alex, Alex Howarth. What are your thoughts? Why would somebody do a practice beat before they um, they uh, start their race? Um, I think they do a practice beat um, because they get used to uh, twisting the sails relative to the wave state. Yeah, that's quite a good thing. Um, and they also, if they are moving across tide lines, they get to have a look at where they are. Yep. Stuff, stuff floating around in the water. Um, and there's something else, uh, sort of pressure differential across the course. Okay. Sailing, sailing from one side to the other. Yeah. Yeah. That's, th those are some really good points there, Alex. Nice work. Um, all right. And so, uh, let's, uh, grab Malcolm Buchanan. Something I know I should be looking for, but I've never managed to work it out, is the sort of um, when the wind is shifting and what the timing of the shifts are. Yeah, so, I mean, I was going to say, what, why are we looking for these things? You know, what, what, what's the reason you're looking to, to try and find these things before the race has started? Um, so, well, so that you, you've got an understanding as to whether the wind is moving around or whether it's constant. Therefore, yeah. whether you're going to be tacking on shifts or just going hard left or right, depending on yeah. where the tide is. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really good. Some really good points there. And um, just picking up on that, Malcolm, do you think that's some stuff you could have done before you left to go to the sailing club with your Met sort of research? Would you know what sort of what we classify as a sort of type of day to understand what to expect? No, I've never done it. That's a good thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, let's go to Richard Lilly. What will our um, pre-race research give us before uh, the flags start flying on Bavistock? Um, so this is what Malcolm sort of touched upon your know, oscillations and shifts. You'll you you sort of get a chance to have a feel of those. Um, an interesting one for Limington is also bend. How much bend are you getting as you approach that shore? Um, and that might be nice to look at, and that changes on day to day. Uh, so you know, will you, are you getting lifted as you approach the shore? Or are you not? Uh, and those things happen quite useful. Uh, sea state across the course, how far your tidal shift affects across the course. There's a, there's a lot to learn going up there. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Top sailors of practice beat. So we discussed wind shifts, where the pressure is, um, also the bend. I like bend. research. <laughs> yeah, spell check. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I um, am yeah, <laughs> dyslexic PC. And it's, it's the Greek spelling. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Tidal effect. And, uh, another little one, I mean, Alex actually, uh, when we asked him at the start there, he came in with a great one. You know, you can check your sail settings when you do that. I mean, we, we discussed uh, sort of sail uh, the other week, so I didn't want to sort of, like, you know, chuck too much in here. But, yeah, you can check your settings. But uh, also another thing to look for, maybe ley line transits. You know, if you know that, you know, percent or Y or whatever it is, looks like it's probably going to be your favourite choice for a, uh, a windward mark 
uh, that day. You can also have, sail up to that mark if you've got time and just kind of work out when you're going to be on the ley line because, um, you know, with the tide that's going and running at that time, if the wind's not too shifty, you know, you can probably find a decent idea of where you're going to need to tack to get into that windward mark so you don't over or under shoot and have to either reach down to the windward mark or or try and uh, chuck a few extra tacks in to get there at the last minute right so we're trying to form a strategy based on our research <laughs> I think one other one that's maybe Limington specific is the wave state across the course as well. Yeah. In, slower, in slower boats, yeah, um, you can if you go out, it gets can get really rough. So although you're getting an advantage of more tide, it's so rough that you're actually better off being a little bit more inshore, a little bit less tide, but the water's smoother. Yeah, that's that's where we brought it in the fast boats too. Right. Yeah particularly downwind yeah that's yeah no, that's a really good point um yeah if you've got wind against tide you know nice southwesterly on an outgoing tide an ebbing tide um yeah, yeah waves are going to jack up short and sharp when you get offshore in the slightly deeper water so yeah trying to uh, sail in flat water with good pressure the boat will go quicker so simple tactics what are we looking for what information do we need what can we do to make our boat go fast? All right, I am going to grab, um, I'm going to go, I'll go to Mr. Bunce, our lovely dinghy park manager. Right, simple. What are we looking for, Chris? Uh, more wind. So more wind. Uh, I know that I would be looking for which side of the course might have more wind. Um, yeah. I'd be trying to stay out of the way of people, to be honest as well. <laughs> um, and I would be looking at the fleets that have gone ahead and which ones appear to have done better than others to try and uh, basically see which side is, is best. Yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's some really good. Uh, who else we've got to grab? Uh, Joe, the lovely Miss Barrable. So what information are you looking for when you're, uh, when you're planning your tactics for, for, the, for, for the first leg? Uh, well, I'll be looking what who's around me. Yeah. Uh, and also be thinking about trying to keep my boat flat. Flat boat is a fast boat. Yeah. Um, I'll be trying to check where Richard Russell is because he thought was a good clue and try and find. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And generally just trying to look for something potentially either on the land, if I can look close enough to the land to see, you know, wind direction, looking at um, where possible gusts might be coming in as well. Um, and generally steering clear of everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That'd be my tactic and staying upright. Yeah, and staying upright is definitely a very good one. All right, well, let's just like a simple tax. Can I just come in? Yeah, please do. If you can, look for the mark first. It's always nice to know where you're going. <laughs> I remember doing one of those uh, Jim Sultan still coaching things at the Royal. I think I was crewing for Nigel and Susie Brook in their J80. And uh, and I walked in late, grabbed a coffee at the back and had a, had a croissant. And Jim Sultan still was doing his five points on there. Uh, how to have a successful race. And he just got to the bit where he said, navigation. I remember a young man in a 420 got a perfect start, shot off like a robber's dog, got to the windward mark, hoisted his kite perfectly within only a couple of boat lengths, and then looked back over his shoulder, the rest of the fleet going the other way around the mark. Yeah. Morning, Gareth. I was like, oh, great, thank you. you know, that's <laughs> right now. Um, okay, so, so tactics made simple. We talked about lots and lots of different things there, but the basis were looking for clear air, looking for favourable tide, looking for good wind. You know, and that applies upwind and that applies downwind. Makes, makes very little difference, you know. Um, we need these things. These are three key aspects that are going to make sure that your boat is going fast. Now, none of those are easy to... Uh, 
to ascertain. But if we work out our strategy, as we were talking about pre-start strategy, why we're doing the research, we execute our start, we've thought about the ideas of maybe starting just to lure it of a pack, maybe footing off a bit like Pete Barton was saying to just get our nose ahead so that we can kind of control what happens in our race a little bit more. Or we look at like that start video I showed you where um, we had the aero and the taser were kind of in a gap between two sides of the fleet on the start line. So they gave themselves a bit of air. Then we can, once we've got that clear air, we've got boat speed. You know, we can, we can, we can hike hard. We can keep our boat flat, like Joe said, keep the boat going fast and we can look for those wind shifts and we know where the tide is and we can sort of head in the direction we want unob unobstructed by boats that are going to force us out of our plan. Gareth, can I just add something to your favourable tide? Sure. Uh, we often race across the time when the tide changes. Yeah. So knowing when the tide is going to change, uh, which is really based on Portsmouth tide tables, is absolutely critical. Otherwise, you will find that you were last time on the last lap, you went a certain route and you had favourable tide, but the next time you'll find you've got an adverse tide on the same route. Yes. So, yeah. uh, Definitely. So yeah, yeah. With what Carl was saying in terms of pre-race research, yeah. knowing when the tide is going to change is, is pretty critical. Yeah. Can I, jump, so can I jump in there? Sorry, brilliant, Malcolm. It, and something I forgot to mention last week in the Tides talk was keeping you... I, I, I mentioned about looking at the marks and the lobster pot and everything else that are in the water. But checking that all the time as you come past the mark, quick glance down if you've got time to check where the tide is at the moment, especially if you're expecting the change. And the other thing is um, pre-start going out and checking that and just validating that it's doing what you expect. I, f I forgot to say that last week, it was validating all the time. Okay, yeah. uh, it's all very well just looking at the book and saying it's going to do this an hour and a quarter before and forgetting about it. You need to be validating like we do with the weather. But Malcolm's point is brilliant. It does turn mid-race and it will make a difference on lap two than it did to lap one. Yeah. Change your Huge Thank you. Yeah, know, I, I quite often do, do my pre-race research, you know, the day before. Um, I don't like to do it in the morning and rush myself before a race. I like to have a leisurely morning. So I check the tides, what it's going to be, when there might be a change. And if, if there's going to be a change mid-race or, or if I'm out for the two races, I often set the uh, alarm maybe sort of five, ten minutes before I think the tide's going to start taking effect. And then I've got a kind of a preempt ready to start really concentrating on finding those tidal differences or taking advantage of the black water and then hopefully taking advantage of the uh, the good tide when it when I've got my alarm going off and nobody else has noticed and uh, and I can execute my tactical plan cunningly. So that is simple tactic there. And then we move forward to looking at a few other little things here. So evaluating your progress. So we've talked a lot about pre-race, pre-start strategies, doing a bit of research. Once we're in the race, evaluate how it all went you know did we get that start just to lure the five boats by the committee boat going into the tide like in that last sort of uh, little illustration i gave you it, did we get there or did six boats come up and sort of rob us and we end up having to reach down was i a little bit late and therefore i had to bear off a bit and i, I started a bit more three quarters of the way to the pin end you know how did my start go did it actually work though, even, you know, whether it was a good start or a bad start? Am I in a good position? You know, can I look around me and say, I've got clean air, I'm going in the right direction, I'm going where I want to go, or I'm not going, what do I do? You know, we all know that there's so many variables involved with sailing that you can't always execute exactly what you want to do. But maybe after two minutes after the start, just evaluate where you are have a look at it when you're a bit further down the course say half the way up the beat just evaluate your situation and start thinking ahead about what's going to happen when you get to the windward mark and you're going to go downhill you know what have we noticed with the wind did that pre-start wind bend that rich lily mentioned happen you know is it is it taking effect that day it varies from day to day mm -hmm. and you know let's use new information and adapt our strategy 
you know let's 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 look at those marks in the water as Carl was just saying let's just remember whether Malcolm had reminded us that he'd checked the tides and it does change the race on this on the first lap halfway up the beat you know let's keep looking for trends so our pre-race strategy you know we our pre-race um, strategy building our research we were going we were sailing up to what we thought might be the windward mark and we noticed that we were getting lifted all the time on 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 starboard tack so the wind was moving to the right the whole time and that kind of clicks in with what Carl and you had chatted about in the bar the night before about what the wind was going to do the next day and you're doing your, your your weather planner and so on is that trend still happening is it still going on all the way through the beat is it going on when you get to your second beat is it still happening when you're going downwind is it happening fast is it happening slowly keep looking for those trends keep your head out of the boat looking at lots of things that are happening around you and then the exciting bit looking for points to overtake <laughs> There's a really, really good book I've always loved since I was a kid called Winning in One Designs by Dave Perry. And uh, the first chapter or two are all about getting a good start. And then the third chapter, I think it is, starts with, OK, you've cocked up your start. Here's how you try and overtake boats. And he comes through millions of different stories on what you can do, port, starboard, rounding marks, windward, lured, all sorts of different things. But there's some really basic rules for overtaking people and, and and what you're trying to look for is again going back to a very simple keeping clean air keeping your boat speed up where are we clean air favorable tide good wind shifts let's just add in boat speed for that as well which is kind of the result of making all those sensible decisions uh, and looking for points to overtake so i'm going to move on to the final slide of the simplest briefest tactics let ever on Lymington Town Sailing Club Wednesday night uh, mm. chats. What are big gains and small gains? Mm. Here are some things that I've made a list. Um, so big gains. If you if you execute a good start, it's going to be 60% or more of the outcome of the race. Mm. In some races where the tide and the wind direction and the course really dictate that the race is going to become an absolute drag race and there's going to be very little chance for you to overtake. Like the America's Cup. You like the America's Cup. <laughs> yeah. So the America's Cup, I'd say it's 98% about your start unless the wind's going to drop below eight knots. Um, big game, clear air. If you can get your boat sailing in clear air, it will sail at its fastest and therefore to the handicap. And it will sail better than all the boats around that are not in clear air and you'll do very well. That's a huge factor. We've always got to look for trying to get as clear air as we possibly can. Spotting lifts. You can make, you can make huge gains. Spotting which side of the upwind or downwind leg you're gonna take you know, sticking with favourable shifts to sail the shortest distance. The tidal strategy, as we know, at Lewington is, is critical. Mark rounding is your first chance after the start to really make a difference to the boats around you. So let's just say, you, you know, you've, you've got four, four or five boats around you coming into the windward mark. You're trying to pick where you can get that little advantage to get inside them at the mark. Um, you know whether you, you can just maybe on the tack in just push them a little bit further than the, than the uh, than the lay line. Um, you know, just just it's a great opportunity. Lured mark, especially if you're doing your nationals and you've got lured gates. Yeah, you know, there, there's invariably a massive bias on lured gates because we're probably set quite a long time before the boats have reached them. And when you're going around a lured gate, picking the right gate can gain you massive places. I'm sure anyone who's been playing uh, virtual regatta during the lockdowns will notice, you know, if you pick the right gate in that on a wimmered lured course, you can, you can take half the fleet if you're lucky. Another thing that I've read about and that I, I, I really believe works is, is avoiding packs. So we talked about uh, that start line earlier where you had 
you know, Merlin rockets who are going to give bad air to, 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 to the solo Sean was sailing. So, yeah, packs of boats, you know, if everyone's going off in one direction, that's great. That might be the trend you want to follow, but maybe just staying to the side, like Pete Barton was talking about with his start, just getting his nose away from them. If you're going downwind and you've got, you know, a group of boats ahead of you, like say one guy's had a flyer off the line, he's gone round the woman mark and he's off downwind, and then the sort of four or five boats go round behind him and you're just behind that. That four or five boats, they'll all try and shadow the guy in front. They'll try and take his wind and they'll all try and take each other's wind. And what you'll find is that pack all trying to take each other's wind. They all slow each other down. If you actually sail to the edges, you can either catch up with them a lot. Sometimes you can even overtake the entire pack. It's always good to look for staying away from groups of boats ahead of you when you're going downwind and just staying on the edge of boats when you're going upwind. Uh, Hugh Stiles' lectures about virtual regatta and real sailing on Monday evenings, he talks a lot in his tactics about um, being the, uh, the head of the arrow, being the, you know, the, the one that leads attack. So you don't have to be the, the, the furthest boat forward or the most windward boat, maybe just tacking under so you've got clear air, but you're going in the right direction. Um, and then we look at small gains. Once, once you've got all your big gains done, you, you're going to be sailing very confidently and very well in races. Small gains, things we can all work on really, really well that tactically make us better sailors. You know, making sure that our attacking is, is robotic, that it, it, we're, we're super confident. We don't ever have to feel that, oh, no, I'm going to have to attack it. I might lose a place when it, um, when it really matters. I remember a lovely race on a Sunday morning with uh, the wonderful Claire Slay crewing for me in the Merlin. And, uh, and I did the worst thing in the world. We were having a tacking battle with Nigel and Susie. And I said to Claire, right, we're nearly there. We're just ahead of them. All we've got to do is two good tacks and we'll beat them. And me and Claire did two of the worst tacks I've ever done. It was the best thing to say. I put far too much pressure. I should have just not said a thing. Same with jibing. You know, it's a small game, but, but, but the more confident you are, when you can jive and just going through the maneuver and executing with speed and finesse. You know, that's, that's the inches part. The big gains, they're the, they're the boat lengths, two, three boat lengths, small gains. We're talking half a boat length gains, fine sail trim, making sure that, you know, your outhaul, your kicker, et cetera, et cetera, are absolutely perfect. They're incredibly important, but not as important as maybe getting your start right playing the waves downwind. Now, sometimes that can be a massive, massive gain depending on the location. But, you know, it's, a, it's another thing, it's, it's a small margin, something we want to think about. But, you know, the big tidal strategy, lifts, clean air, they're the things that we really, really focus our attention on. Likewise, two cell or three cell boats, spinnaker hoists and drops. And then the ultimate Kiwi, Won the, won the cup for the men, 1995. Lucky Red Sox. If it wasn't for Peter Blake's lucky Red Sox, they'd have never won the cup. So, you know, that's probably 100% right there. Uh, make sure you got your lucky socks on before you go racing. What do you think? That's it. Do we have any... Or any more good ideas? Because we're always up for other people's good ideas. Hmm. Either everyone's on mute or they've all fallen asleep. I'm not quite sure, Carl. Not Gareth, I, 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 no, 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 it's I, very good. <laughs> right, Gareth, we, I guess God. just looking at those two, I'm kind of thinking with the small games, it, they, those to me seem to be the things that I can practice outside of the race environment. Whereas on the big games, that's actually, you've got a race to practice you know, apart from maybe the start on your own, it's more influenced by other people around you and less out of your own individual control. Yeah, yeah. Now your big gains is a lot about your research. You know, your, your, um, yeah, your, you, you, you know, you've got to look at an actual event, haven't you? You've got to have a purpose there. There are things we can practice though, like with the, the Homewood video I showed you at the beginning, you know, just grabbing uh, Jeff and Jeremy or, <laughs> any of your friends the uh, the da danger girl 
um, <laughs> but you, you can just you can just go out anytime you want with a bunch of mates and just set up a little start line and just do a rolling start. I've seen Pete Barton and uh, Dave Ellis out there before, and they were just doing I think it was one minute rolling starts. So every minute they started another time, and they were just using two yellow marks by the rockery. I think it was that day. Quite just, often just use one, look, Gareth. Sorry, say again, Carl. We quite often just use one. Yeah, there's never just, yeah. And they're all empty at the moment during the winter for a few more weeks. So um, just somewhere in the river, find a good um, couple of marks that line up across the wind. And yeah. uh, they're all empty before there's more boats on them. I think very frozen. It has. Very good. Yeah, I, think that, that, I think you've got the point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the video with um, Jane and Steve and Will, uh, where is it? There it is. Yeah. Okay. So you know where that bit is. That's those red mooring boys on the way out the river. So the rockery's back here. And so just a little bit further out and they're, and they're on an arc. That's a great place to uh, to find two marks that will line up as a, as, a, as a start line. Great place to practice. 